Origins to Creation Forming the World. Again, we're going through the Sabbath School lesson quarterly. Um, and uh, we're into the second lesson. Uh, there's a companion book that's written by James Gibson, who also wrote the uh, quarterly, and we're uh, looking at that as well. Um, this is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of 2013, so we're actually about two weeks ahead. The principal contributor is uh, James Gibson, who is the uh, uh, director of the uh, Geoscience Research Institute here in Loma Linda. The main editor is Clifford Goldstein, and there are a bunch of other people that obviously help out. Um, last week we went through Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, which is an overview, and perhaps for that reason we uh, uh, had an overview of the discussion, and uh, it was, took us quite a while to get through. Um, this week we're going to be talking about creation forming the world, and uh, then there are several other ones. Uh, this week is about the first three days. Next week will be about the last three days. And uh, uh, then we have uh, a number of other themes, including applications, that uh, will be interesting. So that uh, one of the things we will do, hopefully, this uh, next few weeks is to not just look at the doctrine of creation, but look at how it gets applied. And of course, in that we will, I think, realize more deeply its importance. The memory verse to, for today is Isaiah 45, 18. Uh, that one's a little bit uh, more difficult than uh, uh, the rest of them. Uh, the last one, which of course was, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Um, how many of you know the memory verse? Um, you know, it's getting harder to do memory verses. And the reason why I think is because instead of one version that everybody uses, um, there are multiple versions. And of course, memory verse means that you have it word for word, which means that if you have a bunch of versions, you don't have it word for word if you have it in one version. Um, but the, uh, the memory verse uh, for this time, uh, we'll actually run into it in a little bit uh, here, but uh, it's, uh, For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord and there is none other. And that's the New King James Version. Uh, I'm missing an S there. Uh, scientists are increasingly impressed by the fitness of the world for living creatures. And no wonder. For design and purpose are affirmed throughout the Bible beginning Genesis 1. Starting with a planet that was unformed and unfilled, God spent the first three days forming the world for occupation and the last three days fulfilling it filling it. This week's lesson focuses on those first three days of the creation week. Some scholars have objected to the idea that God would impose a purpose on nature, arguing instead that he simply allowed the material world to be itself and to develop by natural processes supposedly inherent in itself. This is a common theme among those who promote various forms of theistic evolution. Yet such ideas are not compatible with scripture or with our understanding of creation. The universe has no inherent will of its own. The creation is not an entity independent of God, but is, it is instead God's chosen arena in which he can express his love for the, for the cre to the creatures that he has made. And of course, I would have to say that there's no independent uh, empirical evidence that the creation actually can do the things that it's alleged to have done. For Sunday, we start out with, about, uh, with the beginning, uh, Genesis 1-2, uh, uh, actually Genesis 1-1 to start with. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Um, 
what do these verses reveal about the earth before the Lord began creating life on it? Uh, I'm not uh, going to expect an answer right now, uh, but we'll come back to that question at the end of the lesson. The Bible starts with the story of creation, and the creation story starts with the statement that God is creator. It then describes the condition of the world when God began to prepare it for occupancy. When the story begins, the planet is already here, but it is unformed, unfilled, dark, and wet. The succeeding verses describe how God first formed the world into an inhabitable place and then filled it with living creatures. The text does not tell us exactly when the rocks and water of the earth came into existence, only that the world had not always been suitable for life. The world became fit for living creatures only because God acted to make it so. What does Isaiah 45.18 teach us about God's intention at creation? And here is Isaiah 45.18 that, uh, that I just quoted. It says, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. When the earth was first brought into existence, it was unsuitable for life. The Bible says nothing about the time period between the original creation of the rocks and water and the creation of the environment and creatures. Some scholars think it might have been immediate, others that it may have been after a long period of time. The simple fact is we don't know. Nor does it really matter. Whatever the case, the material of the earth was created by God. Then at the time of his choosing, he created a suitable environment for life. The crucial point is that the Lord, who is not dependent upon pre-existing matter, used matter that he had at some point already created, something that in its primeval state was tohu vabohu, or without form and void as it's usually translated. Then, through the power of his word, he created our inhabitable world. Then we go to the first day, let there be light. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And. Uh, the Sabbath School lesson again asks, what do these verses teach us about the first day of creation? And among other things that God commanded and it happened. The numerous points can be inferred from this passage. First, light appeared in response to God's command. God's word is effective in determining the state of creation. Second, the light was good. We may wonder why the text says God saw the light. Is there any doubt that God sees everything? The point is that the light made by God was good, even in God's eyes. We know that the light is good because God himself evaluated it as such. Another point is God divided the light from the darkness. Both light and darkness are under God's control, and neither one makes any difference to his activity or knowledge. God gave names to the dark and light portions of time, calling them day and night. God has the right to give names to periods of time because he is the creator of time. And this is very much in the Hebrew tradition. If you name something, you have power over it. A sovereign of time. God is not limited by time. Rather, time depends upon God. Another point of this passage is that there was a period of darkness and a period of light that together comprised a day. Much has been written about the meaning of day in the creation story. We will consider this question later. But we note in passing that the first day was composed of a period of darkness in a period of light in the same way that we observe days now. Also, light is one of the features that accompanies the presence of God. We do not need to suppose that light was invented on the first day of creation, since God existed before the earth was created, and his presence is often associated with light. At creation, light was introduced to the previously dark planet. How, though, could there be day and night before the introduction of the sun into the creation account? Moses surely knew the connection between the sun and daylight. Yet, despite that obvious knowledge, he wrote that what he did about the light and darkness on the first day. God must have given him a knowledge about creation that at present we don't understand, knowledge that cannot be discerned from looking at the natural world. 
Why, though, shouldn't we be surprised that some things about creation remain a mystery? Again, that's an interesting question to come back to. The heavens created, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. God created the firmament, appointed its function, and gave it a name, heaven. The function of the firmament, or heaven, was to divide the water below from the water above it. Today we would probably use the term sky and recognize the division of the sky into the atmosphere which is part of our environment and the space beyond our atmosphere where the sun, moon, and stars exist. And of course, they fade into each other. The atmosphere appears to be the portion of the heaven that was formed on the second day of creation. The atmosphere provides a method for moving water uphill. Water can evaporate and enter the atmosphere where it can be transported to any place on the earth. There it can be brought back to the surface, entered through the, either through the mist, as described in Genesis 2.6, or as rain. God named the firmament, signifying his sovereignty over it. The act of naming implies that God is sovereign over space. Space does not limit God's action in any way because he created and rules it. As with the lighting of the world on the first day, the creation of the firmament was completed before the end of the second day, another dark period of evening and a light period of morning. Much discussion is centered on the meaning of the word firmament. The Hebrew word rakia is sometimes, and it should have a little uh, backwards apostrophe at the end of it to signify the, the uh, Hebrew letter ayin, is sometimes used to describe a sheet of metal that has been hammered into a thin sheet. Hence the term firmament. Critics have argued that the ancient Hebrews actually believed that there was a hard surface above the earth. Thus they argue because no such thing exists, the biblical account is wrong. But this is faulty reasoning. The w use of the word firmament in, this con in that context simply applies to the sky above, both the atmosphere and space itself. We have only to look at the immediate context to know what is, is being talked about. In Genesis, the birds are described as flying, quote, on the, uh, on the face of the firmament, end quote. Genesis 1.20, New King James Version. And in another place, the firmament is where the sun and the moon are seen. Obviously, the birds don't fly in the part of the rakia where the sun and the moon are. Whatever the mysteries of creation narrative itself, one point comes through very clearly. Nothing is left to chance. Why is that point important for us to know, especially at a time when many believe that chance played a big role in our creation? And again, we'll come back to that question. Space for Living, read Genesis 1, 9 through 13, and um, I'll put that up on the, scroll, uh, on the screen in just a bit. Uh, try to envision the incredible creative power of God as he is doing that which is described in this text. How does this account give a logical answer to the old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And, uh, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. This is, of course, the original King James, uh, not the original Hebrew. And. Uh, God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Previous to this time, the earth was covered with water. In order to provide living space for the humans that God planned to create, he changed the surface of the earth to produce basins that received the water and formed seas, allowing continents to appear. This involved a third division of the physical features of the earth. The first division, 
was between light and darkness, the second division between the waters above and the waters below, and the third division was between dry land and seas. Also for the third time, God gave names to the things that he had divided. The dry land was called earth, and the gatherings of the waters were called seas, once again illustrating God's sovereignty over space. God examined the arrangement of land and seas and declared it good. A second creation event is recorded for the third day of creation. The dry land provided space for God to provide the place of food supply for a creature's sin to be created. God called forth plants from the dry land or earth. Grass, herbs, and fruit trees are mentioned specifically. These were to be the sources of food for terrestrial creatures. The text does not indicate how many different kinds of plants were created, but it does indicate that there was a diversity of plants from the beginning. In fact, from what we see today, we know there must have been an incredible variety of these life forms. Also, scripture is clear that there was no single ancestor here from which all plants evolved. Instead, right from the start, there was a diversity of plant life. The concept, fundamental to evolutionary biology of a single plant ancestor, is contrary, contradictory to the biblical account. Look at the incredible diversity of fruit and vegetables and other edibles. How do they present powerful evidence of God's love for us? And again, it's asked, why is it absurd to think that all these things were created, as evolution teaches, by random processes? And then uh, we come to the, uh, I think this is the uh, uh, Thursday or Friday's lesson. What do the following texts teach us about the power of God's word? And uh, it lists uh, three texts, and I've taken the uh, liberty to uh, produce the text afterwards of the reference that's listed. Second Corinthians 4, 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give li the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. This is God saying, when I say something, it happens. And uh, 2 Peter 3, 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And again, the word of God is creating on the third day. The earth standing out of water and in the water. The Bible teaches that God created out of nothing, or ex nihilo, which is simply the Latin out of nothing, by the power of his word and without conflict or resistance in any form. This view of creation is unique to the Hebrews among all the peoples of the ancient world. Most non-biblical creation stories tell of conflict and violence in creation. For example, the ancient Babylonians had a creation story in which the monster Apsu and his consort Tiamat produced a generation of deities that they then attempted to destroy. But Tiamat is killed in the battle. Her body is divided into two parts, one that forms the heavens and the other that forms the earth. Modern men have also created a popular story of creation through violence. According to this story, God willfully created a world in which resources would be in short supply, causing competition among individuals, with the result being that weaker individuals would be eliminated by the stronger. Over time, according to this modern story, organisms became more and more complex, ultimately producing humans and all other living organisms from a common ancestor. <coughs> Yet, the gods of evolutionary theory, random mutation and natural selection, are not the same as the god of the Bible. The god of the Bible is the defender of the weak and the generous provider for all creatures. Death, suffering, and other evils were not caused by God. On the contrary, they came as a natural result of rebellion against his good rulership. The gods of evolutionary theory used competition and elimination of the weak by the strong in order to survive. 
pardon me, in order to create. Even worse, they are responsible for death and suffering. Indeed, death and suffering are their very means of creating. Thus, Genesis 1 and 2 cannot in any way be harmonized with modern evolutionary theory, which at its core opposes the biblical account of creation. And then, this is Friday's further study. Though scripture doesn't explicitly say it, we have a good biblical reason for believing that the universe existed long before life on Earth began. And uh, the question that uh, was ducked uh, in lesson one now comes to the fore. First in Job 38, 4 through 6, God states that there were living beings who sh shouted for joy when God formed the world. This implies pre-existing beings who lived in, in the universe before the Earth was created. The reference to an onlooking universe in 1 Corinthians 4.9 may refer to that same group of beings. Second, the, the serpent was present in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned. In Revelation 12.9, the serpent is identified as Satan, who is thrown out of heaven. Jesus said he saw this happen in Luke 10.18. And also Ezekiel 28, 14 and 15 describe the covering cherub who is perfect at first but eventually rebelled. This implies that there was a period of time before Satan's rebellion and that presumably Satan lived in this universe also. These texts indicated that Adam and Eve were not the first beings created. And uh, some Ellen White quotes that are in the lesson. As the earth came forth from the hand of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, interspersed with noble rivers and lovely lakes. But the hills and mountains were not abrupt and rugged, abounding in terrific steeps and frightful chasms, as they do now. The sharp, ragged edges of earth's rocky framework were buried beneath the fruitful soil, which everywhere produced a luxuriant growth of verdure. There were no loathsome swamps or barren deserts. Graceful shrubs and delicate flowers greeted the eye at every turn. The heights were crowned with trees more majestic than any that now exist. The air, untainted by foul miasma, was clear and healthful. The entire landscape outvied in beauty all of the decorated grounds of the proudest palace. The angelic host viewed this scene with delight and rejoiced at the wonderful works of God. That's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 44. Um, this is a short uh, summary of what the uh, book Origins by James Gibson has to say for this particular chapter, and uh, which is entitled The First Three Days. And uh, uh, it's not intended to be a complete outline. In fact, the parts that are well gone over by the lesson are left out. Uh, he first talks about terraforming the Earth, which of course is something that uh, in science fiction we do to other planets. But here is God doing it to our planet. And then uh, he speaks of uh, God, uh, or Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, which may be literal as well as figurative. Um, light is just the right strength. It happens to be not too powerful. Um, uh, to damage, uh, but at the same time enough to give rise to photosynthesis. It's amazing that the sun happens to peak its, uh, uh, its uh, output in the visible range. The ancient Hebrews recognized that rain comes from clouds, and there's um, references to uh, uh, couple of papers that are uh, written by Randy Yonker and uh, I think um, a couple of associates uh, that uh, backs up uh, his discussion of the firmament. The atmosphere is just right. Um, and he mentions oxygen, nitrogen, not too much oxygen, very few toxic gases and water. Um, I would have to add carbon dioxide to that, although we don't usually think of it as uh, uh, a necessary part of the atmosphere. The plants, if they thought, certainly would. Um, uh, the language of creation appears to be ph phenomenological, that it doesn't seem to be describing 
uh, some kind of a theoretically perfect uh, uh, description, but, but rather what you would see if you were there and looked at it. And I think that we have to keep that in mind if we're trying to interpret uh, the scripture. And, uh, and he mentions that there's three f refrains that occur all the way throughout creation, one of them being in God said, and then one of them in being in God saw, usually in God saw that it was good, and one of them in being that God called things, various things. First, uh, he calls the light day and the darkness night, then he calls the firmament heaven, uh, and then he calls the sea and the dry land. Um, he calls the dry land earth. Um, that's the summary for the Sabbath School lesson itself, and now we come back to the questions and uh, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and the question is, what do these verses reveal about the earth before the Lord began creating life on it? And uh, uh, if there are comments, uh, raise your hand, we'll get the microphone to you. I guess we have one in the, in the back, and then uh, we'll uh, go on to the, some of the other questions afterwards. I don't recall who, but I recall somebody pointing out that the terms form and void basically means, without form means um, disorganized, and, well, and void is empty. Uh, and from that standpoint, you could have something that exists, but it's not organized. Uh, and you could have something that exists, and yet it's not filled. Uh, for example, if you have a, a room, uh, it could be uh, unassembled yet. You have the walls, and you know, have the components there, but it's not organized. Um, and then uh, even after it's organized, it can be not filled with furniture. Um, so you could have the existing components, I think, and still be form and, uh, without form and void. Well, um, I'm looking at the Hebrew. And um, it's tohu abohu. Tohu is not fulfilling a function, probably is as good as I can give a translation. And bohu seems to be a word that's um, almost in a Dr. Seuss way. Uh, just uh, as, as if it rhymes with tohu. Um, and so you, the, the impression I get is just uh, probably the closest English translation I could get would be helter-skelter. And, uh, you know, uh, what it says is the world started out when God first created it, whenever that was, as a totally disorganized uh, and, and uh, you know, water is apparently on, on everything. Well, that's kind of organized, but then again, water is not organized. Um, and, and so the, the picture is one that's uh, not ready for human habitation, and I think that that's the real point of this. Uh, yes? Yeah, Paul, I was interested in this last month, uh, you know, there was this uh, press leak <clears throat> from the Mars rover team that there was some great announcement about to happen. And so there was a lot of anticipation, and I think a lot of people were anticipating, oh, they found life on Mars. But of course, the, I don't know what the final uh, announcement was, what they found. I didn't hear that because it didn't make the big news like the, the buildup. But... Uh, if you look at Mars, the desolate landscape that you see there with the rover looking around, picking around, looking for any signs of life or what, oh, there's water there, you know, there's... Well, uh, ice anyway. Yeah. And whatever. I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's stuff there, there's building blocks. But if you look at a picture of Mars as seen from the rover and a picture out your window 
as at the earth that has life on it, and you say, okay, life does this, this other place obviously doesn't have life. Because if you turn life loose on a planet, this is what you get, not Mars. That's, I, I think you could look at Mars as a, an example of without form and void. Yeah, uh, you could. Uh, and all you'd have to do is put a whole bunch of water on top of it. But other than that, I agree with you. It's just kind of there, not doing anything. I have a, a question I'd like to ask, and I'm not trying to make a point one way or another here. But in the first verse of Genesis, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then you go down to the fourth day. Is it the fourth? Anyway, when he's, it says, now he creates the sun, moon, and stars. So the earth was here, all covered with water and without form and void. But on the fourth day, he created the sun, moon, and stars. Why didn't he create the solar system all at one time? And why are we saying, why are we making the assumption that between verses 1 and 2, there could be millions of years because the earth was just hanging out here without form and void? Well, one thing that I'll point out that the Hebrew has that does not come through quite as well in most of the translations um, is that as you're reading it, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And that's pretty straightforward. And then it goes, now the earth. Now, literally it's and the earth, but the earth is put next to the the the, the word, or more precisely, the letter, uh, and. And that's a distinct contrast between that and the rest of it. In Hebrews, typically, especially if you're doing a, a uh, narrative form, the verb comes next, uh, as it does in Genesis 1, 3 and following. And God said. It's at literally, and said God. And so that's the standard form. Um, the, what's happened is that uh, here, the, the emphasis is on the noun instead of the verb. And that, that gives you a contrast. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you would say, now David was a, or, or now somebody was a mighty man of war. And they're breaking the narrative so that they can pull in some little side information that you need to know. And so verse 2 is actually that break inside information that, that you need to know. And it continues all the way through because it's uh, now the earth was vaha'aretz um, haya. There is haya at the end. It's a verb. And they could have stuck the verb right next to the, uh, right next to the and. And it would have made perfect sense. But they didn't, and they did it for that very specific reason they wanted to contrast. Now, the earth, as for its sake, was without form and void, this helter-skelter, tohu abohu, however you want to translate that. And, and darkness, another uh, emphasis. There isn't the verb again, because you don't need it, but, but again, you're, you're, you're emphasizing the, the, the noun is get the and. And again, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And, and, uh, and the, uh, you could have used uh, was hovering the Spirit of God if you wanted to make it a narrative. But it's not a narrative. This is a side piece of information. And then God said, let there be light, and the narrative takes off. Um, and so you have this long, well, for, for the story anyway, uh, long interlude where that's what's going on. Now, you can, you can try to make what we might call quasi-scientific models. They're not scientific models in the strict sense because none of this is reproducible by us. 
or even by nature until God decides that he wants to reproduce it. Um, but we have, we, we can make, if, if maybe I can put physical models, where one of them is that God started one 24-hour period and made the earth and then started molding it immediately. Uh, one of them is that God made the earth, let it set for a while, and then whenever it was his time to do it, he started doing that. And was that 13.7 billion years later? Uh, I don't know. And in fact, there are some suggestions that perhaps uh, that figure may be exaggerated. Um, plasma universe doesn't take near as much time to create. And so perhaps what we're looking at is people getting the maximum age they can uh, consistent with, uh, uh, with the material of the universe staying material. And that may not be a fair way of doing it. How does that fix day four? What is the? How does what you have just explained? The fourth day? Well, that's, that's, there are. Was anything created there or were those already out there as well? There are three models that I, that are pretty consistent. And then uh, one model that I heard just recently, which is a fascinating one to me. And that is uh, the, the well, the, the first three models, one of them is God created everything in six 24-hour days, and that includes the galaxy and uh, the next galaxy and the next galaxy and so forth. Um, and that fits in nicely with the story. Uh, the only problem that we have is that light appears to be coming from uh, what appear to be stars. And unless you can figure out some way of speeding up light, uh, that gets you out to, well, uh, let's supposing that the Earth has been around for 10,000 years, which is, uh, or life on Earth has been around for 10,000 years, which in the biblical count would be probably a reasonable maximum. Uh, that means that if you have stars that are 40,000 light years away, they shouldn't be seen yet. So if you're going to go with that model, you have to do something with the speed of light. You have very little choice. Either that, or you can go with um, uh, Russell Humphrey's model, which says that the 24 hours on Earth at the beginning uh, are time that is slowed by uh, relativity. So 24 hours on Earth is actually includes enough time to, to create the universe. Um, and they really are, from their perspective, that old, just not from our perspective. Um, and it kind of fits, but the, 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 one, the one problem I have with that is that there's no testable consequences for it that, uh, that um, differentiate it from the standard model. So from a scientific standpoint, uh, it's basically ignored. It's a, it's a nice harmonization device, but it doesn't, doesn't leave you with any, any kind of uh, uh, other thing. That's part of the problem you have with that particular model. The second model is that God created the solar system. Um, the fact of the matter is outside of radiometric dating, and uh, that argument for me has kind of fallen flat. Um, there's no particular aging. Uh, uh, there's no way of saying the solar system is that old. Light crosses the solar system in well less than 24 hours, so Neptune would have been seen by the, easily by the fourth day if God had created it then. Um, And, and that model doesn't have problems with the, the speed of light. What it does have uh, problems with is the lack of intermediate uh, uh, radioactive isotopes on Earth. And uh, uh, if radioactivity can be sped up, which 
there's some good evidence for. Um, and not, not anything that can be proved at this point, um, but certainly, uh, and I, I think that we should be looking at that question pretty hard, but uh, if radioactivity was sped up, then the absence of intermediate uh, isotopes doesn't make too much difference either. Uh, the, uh, the third model is that God created the solar system However, he created it, and it was just kind of there, and then God decided to basically terraform everything. Now, what that does to the sun is it says, well, there wasn't really, uh, the sun was shining the whole time. Uh, it's just that you couldn't see it from Earth. And phenomenologically, that's a possible explanation. Now, the way it's used in the theology of the day it was written, it just, to me, it doesn't, it is not theologically satisfying to say, well, what God really did was clear the atmosphere a little bit on the first day so that light could get through, and then clear the atmosphere a whole lot so you can actually see the disk of the sun and the moon and perhaps not even clear the atmosphere well enough to see the stars until after the flood. Um, it's a theoretically possible model. Um, a final model, which is kind of interesting, is to say that God uh, basically had all the parts in place except the sun wasn't actually shining. And that on the fourth day, that God kind of lit the fire. Um, one of the interesting things is that, that there are two different explanations for light being on the first day and instead of the fourth day, and I think we may be getting into that. Uh, uh, and one of those explanations is um, the, the, the mechanical one where God lets a little light in and he lets a little more light in. Uh, the second one is that God was deliberately saying, I don't need no stinking sun. That this is a demonstration of God's power. When God wants light, he gets light. And the sun is totally irrelevant. And one of the things he's trying to say is that I am the light of the world, that, that the sun should not be worshipped because it gives us light now. It does, but it didn't at first. Now, if that is the theological point, and there's kind of a good argument for that being the theological point to the ancient Hebrews, the idea that, well, God started out by making the sun at first, but you just couldn't see it very well totally undercuts that theology. That is, God says he doesn't need any sun, but he really does. So that if you use that as a theological argument, if you buy that as something that God would use for the Hebrews, then you're kind of stuck with not having the sun shining until the fourth day, for real, because otherwise, this is all, God was really dependent on the sun. He just didn't want to tell us that. So that's something to think about. And frankly, there's a great deal of attraction to the idea that one of the things God wanted to do is to demonstrate to onlookers and to future people who listened that he doesn't really need the sun. And if that's the case, then the sun wasn't shining on the first day or the second day, or the third day. That you have unidirectional light, and this was a problem actually that, uh, that St. Augustine had, was why should the light go around the world? And of course nowadays, when we know that the Earth actually turns, you don't have to have the light going around the world. All you have to do is the light coming from one direction, the world turns, and we're fine. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why St. Augustine felt it okay to deviate from the biblical record and say that 
The creation happened in an instant, but it's being told to us in six-day segments so that we could understand it better. Um, people use Augustine as an argument that the sun, uh, that the earth was created in, in not six days, and you don't have to buy that from the biblical record. Interestingly, nobody buys Augustine's um, vision of creation now. They just use it to muddy the waters. Yes. You know, I have two comments. One is that um, we, <clears throat> we may be contesting some of these models and comparing them with the biblical account of creation because of, a la because of our lack of uh, knowledge what God had. That is true. And we are now trying to figure it out how he did it. And the, the, when it says, and God said, let there be light, well, God certainly is not dependent on elements to do what he needs to do, even though we are now trying to figure it out what those elements do and how they may have come about. But God doesn't have that question in his mind when he wants to do something, as you said. He can do it. And on, on the fourth day, the uh, Bible says here, and he created them to mark times and seasons. Now, if he had not done that to separate the darkness from light, the, crea the creatures he made could be working constantly because they were created to live forever. And so the greater good of the fourth day creation would be to bring organization into man's activities, day and night. So there'll be some kind of a balance in the activities of a human being. Uh, and I agree with you on that. Uh, uh, like I say, I have, I have a great deal of attraction to the idea that, that this is God saying, and I did it my way. Um, but if that's the case, then he has to do it his way. You can't have a God that says, I did it my way, but really didn't. I've always appreciated that Ellen G. White quote, especially the part about these magnificent trees. I watched a forest ranger drill into a tree and pull out a core and explain to us that the lines indicated the life, that the years of the tree. Um, those first trees that appeared, I don't know whether they had timelines or not within them, but I think it might be a fault to try to ex understand God's creation by today's scientific methods. Um, if, if he could call a tree into existence, he could call it with rings or not rings, the speed of light, we think we understand it today, but God could manipulate the speed of light. He didn't have to wait for it to arrive. So trying to understand this phenomenon of creation through science of today, that may be our weakness. Uh, yes. Um, I found a couple of verses in Revelation chapter 21 about the new earth uh, verses 22 and 23 but I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple uh, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God illuminated it and uh, that seems to Point back, to, uh, point to a day forward when uh, the sun will also be irrelevant, as apparently it was irrelevant uh, the first three days. I'd like to comment quickly on three or four individuals who have given their thought and, in fact, their lifetime careers to solving some of these problems. Um, gentleman just mentioned about tree rings. Uh, Frank Marsh, who was once our neighbor there in Bering Springs. Um, taught and actually wrote in his books that 
um, Earth, when it was created, had the appearance of, of age. And tree rings is one of the arguments. The other is, did Adam have a belly button? Frank Marsh didn't really touch that issue. <laughs> 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 it's Which, uh, by the way, comes uh, goes back to the book Amphalos, right? Uh, mm. Which, of course, is simply certain, simply Latin for belly button. But he did speculate that um, there were soils created. Uh, God didn't just, um, you know, I, I'm, age I'm the. I'm uh, probably wrong. It's actually Greek for belly button. But yeah, anyway, that's right. He, God didn't age the uh, surface features to wait many centuries for soil to create. So God created soils on the third day. And then also God created the minerals and the rock and they had their vast ages. So that's one way of solving it. Um, one of our class participants for many years was Robert Brown and I've talked with him personally on a lot of these issues. And uh, he believed that um, prior to creation, the Earth was in a moon-like or Mars-like or Mercury-like state. And that you get the uh, progression of radiometric ages because the hot magmas coming out of the Earth were zoned according to what we now call geological age. And so they buried the fossil in a s fossils in a certain order, especially during the flood. Uh, that's a very complex model. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around it, but that's uh, certainly a legitimate model to look at. Uh, Robert Gentry, I've interacted with him back in the 1970s and early 1980s. And I remember when he said that, uh, quoting these uh, biblical texts about the heavens or the hosts of heaven praising God, Job 38, praising God at the time of creation. He said uh, they were created perhaps on the first or second day of creation. And even Lucifer was created on the first or second. Now that was kind of a speculation he never put down in writing, but we did correspond and I talked to him personally. He backed away from that when we quoted great controversy, I mean patriarchs and prophets, where in the, the controversy was in heaven over the question of God planning creation prior to creation. And then it even says, Ellen White under inspiration says that God bore long with Lucifer. Now if Lucifer was created and cast out during creation week, it doesn't show the long suffering of God. So Gentry backed right off of that and, and <laughs> I'm thankful that he did uh, take our advice on that. But then he also used an Ellen White quote where in testimonies the Lord says that all of nature reminds us of the great power of the Creator. And as we look at the heavens above and the stars, and as we look at the earth below and study the flowers, we recognize that within six days all of these were made. And so he used that quote that we don't often look at to say that God created in six days the visible part of the universe. He's narrowed it down, I think, since then, but I may be wrong on that, that God created just the solar system. Mm -hmm. Does that sound correct? I don't want to misrepresent him. Um, well, your, your, your uh, discussions are beyond what I've... Uh, okay. Anyway, um, a lot of this is oral discussion, but yeah. we do have in print a recent study in 2008 dissertation by Daniel Bediaco uh, at our Avenus uh, International Institute in the Philippines. And it's a Hebrew study of Genesis 1. I was amazed to come across it, and I spent half a day reading it while waiting for a flight out of the Philippines in June. And he made a lot of good sense, and he used exegesis and Hebrew study and stylistic patterns and all kinds of things. And he said, the, for his viewpoint, the flow of thought, progression of thought, and the use of certain expressions in Hebrew indicates that on the fourth day, sun, moon, and stars did come into existence. 
Now, he doesn't use the argument that God made it to appear. Is that maybe another Hebrew expression, but he says, fourth day, God, or these things on the fourth day, including stars, came into existence. So here we have four different viewpoints, three by a scientist and one by a theologian, and that's where we're at now, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that uh, I think uh, the actual biblical narrative fits a little closer to the uh, current scientific uh, sort of viewpoint of how planets and stars are formed than we actually kind of think. I'm thinking, you know, God wouldn't just stop creating or do creation all at one time. I kind of think of him as that's his nature. He likes to create. So he'd create some here. He's like a painter. He paints a little bit and then he paints a little bit more and he paints a little bit more here and there. But currently, you know, stars and planets, things are considered to be formed, you know, like in, in nebulas where you have a lot of gas and dust and, and dense material, but it's not formed into anything except a cloud. And then gravity takes over and eventually, you know, it's going to clump up together in smaller pieces. So you're going to get rocks and asteroid type stuff. And then that densifies some more. And then you'll get the planet size bodies. And then that gravity takes over some more. And then you eventually get the stars. So my question would be, why isn't it that kind of fits pretty clearly with the text. I mean, you don't have much form, and then God calls into being the, the planet, and then another day or two goes by, and then he calls into being the, the sun and the moon and, and that kind of stuff. It seems to fit pretty close. You're suggesting that uh, perhaps God simply speeded up a process that uh, could happen elsewhere? Yeah. Well, actually, yes, he, he speeded it up. He, he can do it on whatever time frame he wants to. And it would seem to me that the evidence is actually out there. We can see him doing it now, or what he'd done, you know, because of the speed, if he left the speed of light alone, what he can see places that he created before he created us, because the light just finally gets here. Yeah. And that would also work with your, uh, you know, radioactive mm -hmm. uh, problems as well, because once you, you know, light off the nuclear fireball of the sun, that, you know, chain reaction speeds up. Same thing with, you know, when you're uh, densifying the gases, that would speed up some of those reactions. No, and I, and I agree with you. I think that, um, I think that it's, it's dangerous for us to limit God to what we can see in nature today. And I think that uh, we try to do that where, uh, because if you do that, you can't have a second coming. You can't have the resurrection. I mean, the fact of the matter is none of us here have ever seen somebody rise for the dead that's been dead for three days, let alone for uh, uh, 300 years or 3,000 years. Yes? There, for me, there's a possible problem with it's while well, true God can do anything he wants and make anything appear however he wants with appearance of age and and whatever you, you want to do um, if you make if you start making that argument for everything you get into um, a position where uh, your position is not testable or falsifiable you, you can't really you just said well God did it that way and that's that's the end of discussion there's you can say that for any observation, for absolutely anything. Uh, you know, the same observation is used, well, why do animals look like they evolved? Well, God made it look like they evolved. Why do, why do the fossils look old? Well, God made it that way in order to test our faith. Right? <clears throat> and, and pretty soon you start saying, well, science is really just a test of our faith. You know, it's a, God really made it so science is irrelevant. Uh, science really doesn't have anything real to say about anything after a point, and then uh, religion becomes non-rational, um, or maybe even irrational at some point. And, uh, and then you're just like, well, what, why should I believe it? 
Why should I believe what the Bible is saying? Because I have no rational basis to believe it. And I think we start stepping off into dangerous ground on that end, at least for me. I, I think that um, it's, it's better to say that God generally creates along lines of natural law when he can so that we can identify his signature in nature rationally. And uh, that once you start saying that he goes outside of the bounds of nature all the time, uh, then you, you start eliminating the, any rational ability to identify his signature. I think here it would be wise for us to focus our major attention on that which is most clearly explained and demand less uh, rigor from that which is not explained as well. Um, but leave that part open. You know, I have a simple policy. You know, when, when I face something that I don't know the answer to, I put it on the back shelf in my mind somewhere to, to come to when, when, when I encounter suitable information that will be helpful. Uh, but I, I don't try to hammer it into whatever hole I feel it ought to fit. Um, I personally find God to be rational, loving, good, and, and, and reasonable in everything he does. So he would clearly be doing something in an orderly manner. It seems to me at least, reasonable, that he would create a universe, then he would create galaxies, then various solar systems within those galaxies, and then by and by he would come around and decorate individual planets as he sees fit. I mean, would we not do similarly? I mean, when we build a house, we don't move furniture in first. We first build the foundation, then we put the walls up, then we put the roof on, and then we begin to paint the walls and rearrange uh, things inside, and finally we bring the furniture in. You know, we, we, we don't just do it in some kind of mm, random fashion, you know. So, I mean, after all, we're in the image of God. I mean, there should be some order in the way things are done. Now, do I have evidence for all of this? No, I do not. But I'm happy to discover how he will do it. And I look forward to the millennia in the new earth and the new universe when we'll be able to travel and inquire and research to our heart's delight unencumbered by sin, prejudice, and various other bigotries. And um, I think in the meantime, uh, I think we need to be careful about how we hold our views. Well, uh, I think that uh, it's, fine to, uh, it's fine to have an opinion. Sure. I think it's fine to know what the evidence behind that opinion is. And it's fine, it's even better for us to recognize that the evidence can change. Uh, as we get new evidence or we find out that old evidence was more faulty than we thought. Uh, and I think that it's, it's helpful for us to be clear-headed about that and at the same time to be very charitable to people who have a different view than what we do uh, for the simple reason that all the evidence isn't in and for us to try to manage everybody else's opinion, I think, is a mistake. Uh, oh, we have a comment up here, and then, well, uh, and then after that. Uh, I believe that the way God created us, he wanted us to study, he wanted us to question, to be curious, and then to rejoice as we learn more how, how things evolve in our thinking just like the time we believed that the earth was flat. And as we discovered that it, that was not the case, we rejoiced in the discovery. But uh, science, uh, scientific, current scientific 
principles cannot define or, or uh, uh, negate how God created and what he did. But it should give us a rejoicing point as we learn more and discover even more how he did it. I agree. Um, I could add one more prominent Adventist physicist who has speculated on how things came about, and that's Clark Rowland, who's now retired from Andrews and taught there most of his life. By the way, he took, um, I think, M he took an MDiv in the seminary, if I remember right, at least did a lot of seminary training. He was thinking of going into theology at one time. Um, the way he reconciled the long geological ages with Genesis 1, which depicts a time frame of seven literal days, and I firmly believe that these days were literal. That's the subject of my dissertation. Um, he speculated that God created Eden as an earthly cosmos. And when he was creating Eden, he took Eden on a trip, and the trip was through space near the speed of light. And because Eden was going near the speed of light, time, there was a time warp, and the radiometric ages were ticking off in a more or less uh, normal fashion. Like Sean has mentioned, God keeps his laws as tight as possible. But at the same time, if you're going near the speed of light uh, and you have seven literal days, they can be seven billion years or even longer. Uh, that, to me, <laughs> smacks of science fiction. Uh, but see, that's still a miracle. It's, yeah. It's kind of yes, like yeah. Dr. Bull is here. I well, mean, he uses this cartoon where he has this formula up there, you know, and then you go along, yeah. and then a miracle occurs, right? Yeah, and, and then you yeah. go along and along the rest of the formula. How in the world do you know when the miracle occurs if yeah. everything is a miracle? Yeah. I mean, come on. You have, to, you have to be able to draw a line somewhere and say, okay, now a miracle has to occur because oh. not everything is a miracle. You, some, some things have to follow natural law. And if you say, well, God could have done it this way, that w well, it's all what you're describing it requires a spectacular miracle in order to explain all those things. And it makes it so that you really can't detect anything else. You and, can't you well, can't detect natural law in that. I, I think that 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 is a a rational critique. Um, I think that the way to overcome that is to point out that there are a few things uh, that don't really fit with the standard model. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, uh, some of the work that's been done on, for example, paraconformities soft sediment de deformation that don't really fit with the millions and millions of years. Um, that, uh, for that matter, uh, residual carbon-14, residual beryllium-10, which doesn't really fit with millions and millions of years. Uh, some of which really hasn't been tested very much. And uh, some of the testing, most of the testing that was done on carbon-14 was, for example, was yeah, accidental but, until but 2005. See, then, then, Paul, well, if you start making those arguments, it's like, okay, why did God make it appear that it, we radiometrically were millions of years old, hundreds of millions of years, yet he left these other things uh, in there. Wh why didn't he fix those up as well to make them look like they had age mm -hmm. also? Well, that suggests that perhaps, uh, perhaps yeah. some of the other stuff is being read, Incorrectly, uh, if I can right? put it this way, over-optimistically. Oh, I'd like to expand. I mean, you can't. You can't really have it both ways. You can't say, "Well, God made it have the appearance of age," yet He also made it appear young at the same time. I mean, well, which one is it? Actually, you can have it both ways, and the reason you can have it both ways is because of Adam. Now, Adam doesn't have any memories of life before the sixth day, so there is the memory evidence for Adam that he is only one day old. No, I'm talking about fossils, like you know, <laughs> well, a fossil record. Uh, well, but, no. I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm pointing out that the fossils <clears throat> might very well have a parallel in Adam. Uh. Uh, the second thing is that Adam <clears throat> is, uh, looks like he's uh, probably in his day and age 60 years old. Uh. 
Um, at least he's a young man. He's, he's old enough to enjoy sex, so he's... He's... Um, uh, he's, um, you know, a, a minimum of, of 14, let's say. Uh, and no matter how, uh, even if you put it in modern terms. Uh, I mean, if you think about how uh, people of that day, uh, they used to get married at 65, so, you know, uh, we don't think of it that way. But, but in, in, in point of fact, even if you put it in modern terms, he was 14 years old at least, so that he could appreciate a, a good-looking woman when he saw her. Uh, you know, maybe he looked what we would say 14, and he was really 65. Maybe people aged a little bit differently then than they do now. But, <laughs> but in any case, and, and this is one of the things we have to kind of expand our minds about, is that, is that what we see today is not the norm, because the norm was to live 900 years. Mm. And uh, nobody around here now lives <coughs> 900 years. Pardon me? That, that is true. The norm is to live forever. But the point of it was, Adam was not a baby. Yeah. However you cut it, Adam was not a baby. He looked older than he was. Paul? So, so you, you, you have a mixture of both. And I don't have a problem with some things pointing towards short age and other things, if you look at them the right way or the wrong way, depending on how you view it. Uh, Point, looking towards long age, as long as it doesn't look all perfectly like long age, then, uh, then I think that science can at least give us enough questions to ask the questions. Yes, and uh, yeah. go ahead. I mean, obviously God would have to t create full-size full trees and so on if he's going to do this in one day or over six days and so on. He could a man full-size and so on. I, I do get uh, a little uncomfortable where we say, well, uh, maybe he created radio, changed radiometric dates, and you find them somewhat in order in the fossil record. And uh, is God really f fooling us? I mean, was he, did he re was going that hard to, to try and tell us, hey, these things are much older down blah, blah, at the bottom than they are higher up? Uh, I get uh, God wouldn't try and lie to us like that. I, uh, so somewhere here we have to draw a line, and uh, I, I try and stay in the rational realm as long as possible. I rather think other factors. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I rather think you know that uh, uh, maybe other factors could be responsible for some of these dates, such as inherited dates, and. Uh, the fact that things may have been come from the inside the earth uh, towards the surface. So there are other models that are more rational, I think, than uh, this. And we need to be careful to not say, well, God changed certain ones, but he didn't change carbon-14, so residual carbon-14 is really a, uh, a good argument, but the others aren't. Uh, well, I, I agree with you, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've done, if, as you probably know, is to, I try to explore uh, how far you can go without having to change radiometric, uh, radiometric decay constants um, uh, in terms of uh, explaining things in, the, in, in terms of short age. Um, uh, Leslie, uh, Leslie, the philosopher Leslie points out that uh, you know, this universe uh, rests uh, tuned on the knife edge. And you change any of those physical constants, uh, and uh, the whole thing collapses in an instant. And uh, it's OK to, to uh, speculate about these. Maybe the second, uh, uh, I should say, the weak nuclear force might be a factor. But man, we need to be careful what that would do before we invoke it. Well, the one thing that I think uh, is a good policy is not to say more than what we know. That's right. That's and uh, fun to and where, we have, where we have evidence, we can say, here's the evidence, and this is what convinces me at this point that this is the most likely model. But don't get too sclerotic in our models, whether conservative, liberal, or other, 
for the simple reason that we may wind, our, uh, wind up blindsided like the, uh, like the people who opposed Galileo. Yes. I've heard more than once the word miracle. That's music in my ears because it's a theological term and I love theology. <laughs> but the more we talk about miracle, the more we're moving out of the realm of science and we ought to be honest and recognize that. Robert Gentry, I've mentioned him more than once today, um, didn't use the word miracle because there's a prejudice against it, but he talked about singularities and the beginning of this earth, this planet with the radio halos was a singularity. He puts that in print even in scientific publications. He also um, mentions a singularity must have happened at Noah's flood. Now he doesn't put that into scientific papers, but talking with him and listening to him lecture, um, he has to have a change in the decay constants during the flood. Uh, he, his model has to. And for example, radio halos are found in coal. He calls it coalified wood. And some of that is early um, uh, Cenozoic. Uh, Robert Brown did a study of the ratios of the isotopes in those particular halos. The most recent was formed about 230,000 years ago. Bob Brown gave me a table of some of those uh, halos. And if you take just the ratios, point, uh, face value with the decay constants, you have a variety of ages in the most recent 230,000. So you can't Actually, get it Actually, that's down. a misinterpretation of that paper. Well, yeah, that's another, <laughs> and, uh, that's another issue, I we know. Should, we yeah. should go back into it. Uh, that's the most recent one that you can calculate. There are other ones where there was no uh, lead to, what is it, 204, I think it is. Right. Fan, or, uh, maybe it's 208. It's the end result of uranium yeah. decay. Well, there was no lead 208. Uh, I think it's 208 now. The point it's is found at all. In which case, the minimum age is 20 years. You don't have an you age. You don't have a minimum. You don't have an age, so it's impossible. And, to and those ages that you have are minimum ages. Right. They're not maximum ages. Exactly. That's Brown pointed and, that out to me. And and so. Uh, that is consistent with, uh, let's say, a flood 4,300, 4,500 uh, years Gentry ago. Gentry recognized there is a problem if some of those ages are uh, valid. And so he said at the flood you had to have the decay constants change. No, all you have to do is at the flood you have to have, the, you have, to have some of the, the end product infiltrating along with the... Well, yeah. And, and, and that's actually what I would expect because I would expect a little bit of contamination of the lead uh, 208 that's just floating yeah. around with the rest of the stuff as it comes through. Yeah, well that's an and ad hoc it, explanation. And, uh, uh, no, it's not ad it's hoc. Not it's not in the it's uh, scientific literature. It's called contamination and it happens all the time. Well, yeah, then... Okay, that's another question. I didn't mean to raise that <laughs> issue. The, the point is that when you come across a very tough issue, it's easy to say, well, this is a singularity, something really outside of the normal laws of science happened. And I think as a theologian now, I'm speaking as a theologian, God's moral law is a transcript of his character which never changes. And I have a problem with our evangelical f or even fundamentalist friends who say that uh, all of these constants can be changed, you know, almost on a drop of a pen. And these are based, like you mentioned, on the laws. And Ariel, you mentioned that too. The universe is so fine tuned and the laws are so precise and particular when we start changing them there's a whole ripple effect and I think that ripple even extends to God's moral law and unfortunately people are setting us up to dispensationalists where you had a different law before the cross that you have after the cross so I see a connection there well I, I would be a little bit careful with that um, there's the question of the first three days of creation but more importantly the question of the new earth well, apparently the sun is not necessary. 
Um, yeah, but it's not necessary. The point of it is, the Lamb is the light. You don't have to have the sun. Uh, uh, that's different from the way things are now. And it's vitally important for us to realize that it, you can make an argument that God is always lawful. But if that's the case, then natural scientists don't know all the laws. Because Jesus came back from the dead and natural scientists know no, no law that permits that. Second law of thermodynamics, Jesus should not have been resurrected. Lazarus should not have been resurrected. The dead uh, son of the widow of Nain should not have, had, uh, should not have been resurrected. Uh, like it or not, we're stuck with what, uh, you can call it a miracle, you can call it a singularity, I don't care what name you give it. What I do care about is that it happened regardless of whether naturalistic scientists can explain it or not. And in fact, even for radiometric dating, we now have some pretty good evidence that it does vary a little bit, that it is not the fixed constant that we thought it was. And in which case, we need to be really careful about building a, uh, a entire physical space around that and an entire theologi uh, theological system around that physical space, which is what's happening on the other side. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, well, uh, the solar flare thing was apparently more than a, more than a, a percent. Um, the point is we don't understand why it happens and therefore we don't understand the limits and we... Yeah, we can't really use that as an argument. Well, we can't use that as a major argument. What we can say is that if somebody thinks that they have all the answers Obviously, they don't, because we don't know what's going on there. And that's, that's really a position I think we should argue for humility on all sides, including our own, but including people who are willing to enforce us into a position using science. Even though we might not need the sun for light in the new heavens and the new earth, there is an in indication that there will be some type of a gathering on a weekly basis from one Sabbath to the next. And the moon and the sun will be part of that mechanism that allows us to know when the next Sabbath rolls around because there will evidently be a day cycle that will be occurring there and that will be in relation to the Earth's rotation and this new sun that is made. Uh, and I will have to agree with that. I, I think that, uh, that the, the point is not so much that the sun and the moon will, be, will disappear as there's some fair evidence that they'll still be there. They just won't be needed for the, for the purposes that they fulfill right now, particularly the sun. Yes? There's two questions, and we spent the whole hour on the first one that you have there. <laughs> And that is, what do these verses reveal about the earth? The other question is, what does the earth reveal about these verses? I have another. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Anyway, uh, I was going to say, uh, one thing we should uh, keep in mind in all this, especially when we're talking about laws and what the earth reveals and, and what everything else is here, is that um, the fundamental question was Satan questioning God's sovereignty. That's the basic question, and that's why we're having the whole argument over creation in the first place. Because even though Satan was created, he was jealous, basically, and saying the sovereignty of God being the one that has the ability to create wasn't good enough, and he wanted to be able to go off and do his own 
thing, basically, and ignore the laws and, and things that God had set in place. I, I think your question is a fair one. Um, I'm not sure that we have all the answers to that. You, you've done it somewhat because you told us that rakia does not mean a firm. It doesn't mean a firm copper atmosphere or hard thing. So we have used earth science and rocket ships and the fact we can go up there and dive through it and to explain, well, it's not really a dome. So we've used what we know about Earth to explain what the Bible said when it said there was a firmament there. And we've reinterpreted firmament to fit that. Now, Well, actually, to be precise, what happened was that we reinterpreted rakia to mean firmament. Uh, the firmament is the Latin translation of the Greek stereoma, which kind of gives you the same firm kind of thing. And um, we went through this before, on, uh, and we hope to be able to go through it again and give a uh, uh, more complete model of exactly how the Hebrews viewed rakia and its cognate verb rakha. Um, and the, the sense expanse is probably a better translation of that particular thing. Um, but that requires a, a good hour to defend and explain, at least. Um, and I am, I am in agreement that, um, that once things are created, finding out their nature is probably as easily done, or more, maybe more easily done, uh, by looking at them than by reading the scripture account of how they were created. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the scripture account is, is not very detailed in exactly what it, uh, what's happening. It does imply, you know, the birds flying through, uh, whatever this rakia stuff is, and the expanse fits that much, much more easily. And um, uh, there are other texts that we've gone through, and actually a couple of other sessions to, to look at that. Uh, but, but let's let's look at it from this point of view too, and that is that if you look at life, you can postulate a warm little pond with uh, all kinds of ammonium salts and stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't really fit the facts very well. Um, you can say God said, and it was. Um, having God say that he said, well, that's probably trustworthy. Uh, having him say, and it was, well, that you can investigate now. We live. And how we live can be put under the microscope, uh, how we live in the present. Our origin is a whole lot more murky in terms of trying to make a physical model for it. We don't know how to build a cell. We do know how to build DNA now, but we don't know how to build a cell. We're working on it, working on it um, but we've got a long ways to go. Um, and, and so if you're trying to explain what things are like, you can take them apart, you can look at them. If you try and explain where they come from, our science really hasn't gotten there. And the fact of the matter is that people who pretend that it has, they don't even believe Richard Dawkins. You may remember in the movie Expelled, he was asked, well, how did it happen? And he said, nobody knows. <laughs> so.
So, you know, at a certain point we do come across the limits of our understanding. And at those points it's probably wise to listen to somebody who's been there before. Uh, because they probably have more information than we do in that regard. We don't have a clue as to how, to, how life began. We have faced these crises before of the Earth going around and the Sun the center of the universe and the Earth center, those things. And, and we have used good science to help us understand the Bible. And all I'm asking is that you know we don't just impose our understanding of the verses on the Earth, but we also use what we can see on the Earth to help modify our previous understanding of the verses, both. Um, in, in principle, I'm in agreement with that. Um, I think that, um, that one of the things we have to be conscious of that is that this is a, uh, if you want to put it that way, a high stakes game. But at some point, you know, it's, you, you can get ridiculous in that because after a while you can say, well, the verses obviously mean this, that, and the other. This is what the author intended them to say. And uh, obviously, science is conflicting with that. At some point, you can get to a point where you say, say hey, the Bible is just plain wrong. Uh, I think you have to hold your ideas up to absolute falsifiability, or at least a weight of evidence saying, you know, what I thought before is just plain wrong. These, these biblical authors really didn't have privileged information. And you have to hold up that as a possibility uh, at some point that you falsify things and just walk away and say, hey, this, isn't, this is just wrong, if the evidence doesn't support it. And uh, instead of just reinterpreting everything until it becomes ridiculous, just say, hey, it's just wrong. I don't understand what, why that's a, a problem, why we have to maintain biblical credibility in the face of all other evidence uh, when we can just say, hey, look, I just don't believe this anymore, versus if the evidence leads you in that position. And if, I think the reason why we should believe the Bible is the weight of evidence is still there versus what, what the Bible is really trying to say. Um, yes. Um, I think if we start with that which is most clearly given to us and entrusted to us and work from there, instead of picking at some sore spot that nobody understands and work from there, you know, then, then we'll have a little more success. Un unfortunately, we have this peccadillo of picking at some sore spot, wherever it is, uh, until we, we lose all faith and all credibility and all sound reason. Uh, and that's not the way to go. Yeah, but something, I mean, there's always going to be somebody who disagrees with you, and there's always going to be a, sor a source of contention regardless of the position that you take. And so there's always going to be sore spots. I mean, you have to kind of decide for yourself. Well, well, let's put it this way. Ultimately, the whole crux of the problem of the, the Great Rebellion and the Great Controversy comes down to the issue of the character of God. Who is he and what is he like? And if we begin to think of him in terms of, well, he put this here to test us, or he put it there to somehow contrive something or other, those things just smack of deception one way or another. They don't speak to me of, of an honest, upfront God who does things in a reasonable, rational manner, and lets the chips fall where they may. You see, if we're willing to deal with things honestly, we will ultimately come to an understanding. But if we want to strain things into a box, that's when it doesn't matter which persuasion we're of, we will go wrong. I mean, people who crucified Christ did it in the name of God. It, 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 you know, and they were also Seventh-day Adventists of the time, you might say, because they kept Sabbath and waited for the Advent. Huh. Obviously, they missed it. But is it possible for us to make a similar mistake? Um, we, we, need to, we need to have a, a kind of 
more reasonable, more rational approach to this and realize that we are not in it alone. God is in it with us. He has predicted that the subject of creation is going to be an issue at the end of times. And the irony is that after 150 years of evolutionary indoctrination, it has never been more questioned than it is questioned now. Why is that? How is it that we don't look at that interesting <laughs> phenomenon and ask some interesting questions? What is going on? Until recently, the uniformitarian principles seem to rule geology. Not anymore. How is it that we think, oh, well, now, well, we haven't solved yet this and that, therefore, this whole thing doesn't mean anything. You know, if we wait until every last little nuance is answered, we will be at the judgment day. We will be beyond the judgment day. Pardon according me. to, according to Ellen White, we, we'll keep learning throughout eternity, which means we didn't know very much to begin with, which means that uh, <laughs> if we wait, if we wait uh, for every answer to be given, uh, we will literally wait forever. That's probably why morality, I don't think, is based on knowledge <coughs> anyway. Well, I think this is probably a good time to, to stop and uh, uh, look forward to uh, those of you who can make it, making it for uh, uh, next week when we'll talk about the second six days. Um, by that time, I hopefully uh, the uh, Sabbath School lesson quarter will, quarterly will uh, be easily available. It's actually available on the internet uh, if you get the teacher's edition and those of you who get the uh, available. the email. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I have one, so obviously it's available. It's available. It was available at least last week. Yeah. So we'll see you next week. <laughs>